Welcome to My Mind's Eye, an idiosyncratic look at mind and brain and mental disorders, all explored through research, ideas, and even music, but especially through the lens of My Mind's Eye. It's a thrill to be here at Columbia University with Nobel laureate Eric Kendall. Eric was born in Vienna, the home of Sigmund Freud. Early in his career, Freud hoped to relate mind to brain, but soon concluded that the tools available were inadequate for addressing the complexities of the human mind in biological terms. The field of psychoanalysis was the result. Kendall, early in his career, after receiving psychoanalytic training, embraced the brain because he felt neuroscience was ready to tackle the mind. Indeed, modern neuroscience has achieved what Freud had dreamed of, the beginnings of a map of the mind and the brain. And Eric Kendall has been a pioneer in this effort. In my opinion, history will describe neuroscience of the late 20th century and early 21st century as the Eric Kandel era. Eric, let's go back to the late 1950s. You were a psychiatrist, but you were also passionate about research. And of all the topics you could have chosen to study, you picked memory. What led you to that decision? Well, uh, as you indicated in your very generous introduction, um, I was very much interested in psychoanalysis and thought for the longest time of becoming a psychoanalyst. And when I was given the opportunity um, to go to the NIH, um, the head of my lab essentially said, uh, what problem would you like to work on? It gave me complete freedom. And I thought, what's the central problem in psychoanalysis? Um, and I came to the conclusion that certainly a central problem is memory. We are who we are in large part of what we learn and what we remember. And psychoanalysis is an attempt to relive certain painful memories in a protected environment and to work them through and master them. Uh, so I thought understanding memory would be quite wonderful. And the task was enriched for me even more by the fact that just as I was beginning to think about this problem, um, Brenda Milner had just recently discovered that the hippocampus, a structure deep in the temporal lobe, is a critical site for a major class of memory storage. So I thought that studying the hippocampus would be a wonderful beginning for understanding memory. So how did you get started on this hippocampal project? I was fortunate to team up with another young colleague who also was at the NIH to train in science. And um, I showed him this dissection I developed of the hippocampus, which was just marvelous to look at. And he agreed that this was a beautiful preparation. We joined forces, it was all in Spencer, we had a fabulous collaboration. And we were the first people to record from hippocampal neurons um, intracellularly. And I cannot tell you the excitement this caused on the floor we worked on at the NIH, many different laboratories. Here, two incompetent young people coming to the NIH and coming up with a nice piece of science. And we spent the next two years studying in detail the cellular properties of hippocampal neurons. Why did you turn from the hippocampus of mammals, which would obviously be very relevant to human memory, to the nervous system of a sea slug, which is so far removed from the human brain? Everyone was very excited, and we turned to ourselves and we said, what have we learned about memory storage? And we realized we'd learned very little. So I thought I would take a simple form of learning in a simple animal, and try to drive it into the ground. And since my tool was recording from single cells, I wanted to have an animal that had gigantic nerve cells. And people were coming through the NIH giving seminars. It was really the place for neuroscience in those days. And both Ladislav Tork and Angelique Avanitaki, the only two people in the world working on a plissy of the snail, came through. And I realized these were the largest nerve cells in the animal kingdom and they were just made for me, made to order. I first entered the world of neuroscience in the mid-1970s, and at that time, your discoveries about the mechanisms that underlie learning and the aplesia were already making big headlines. 
I was immersed in, uh, in cognitive psychology at that point, and it was uh, sort of common at that time to hear people say something like, well, Kandel has understood a lot about learning in a very simple organism. Um, who cares? Yeah, who cares? What does that have to do with memory? But I think your work has put these criticisms to rest. Do you tell us about how basic mechanisms in an animal so simple and so far from our evolutionary history has shed light on the human mind? What you said was, was a common reaction, and Jack Eccles, who was one of the leaders in neuroscience, said I was throwing my career away, leaving the hippocampus to go for a placebo. So I thought that one needed to take a reductionist strategy to learning as one did to all aspects of biology, that insofar as you identify a mechanism of a general process, it's likely to be conserved in evolution and used time and time again. It might not be used in identical form, it may be very little bit, but the principles will be the same. So I went to a very simple animal with a very simple nervous system to see whether or not one can train it to learn something, and I found you could do that. Because it was so simple, I was able to work out the neural circuitry of the reflex and then see what happens to that reflex when it's modified by learning. We knew from Pavlov and Thorndike um, that there were simple learning tasks that you could teach even to a very simple animal. So I explored habituation, sensitization, classical conditioning, and subsequently other people studied operant conditioning um, of this simple behavior that I isolated. And I was able to show that uh, what learning does is alter the strength of synaptic connections, how nerve cells communicate with one another. And I found that in short-term memory, there's an alteration in how cells talk to each other and the strength of synaptic connections. Um, but there's not an anatomical change. With long-term memory, there's an alteration in gene expression and there's an actual growth of new synaptic connections. So as I like to tell my students, if you remember anything about this conversation, you will have a slightly different brain after the conversation than you had beforehand. And I really thought this was extremely interesting from a psychotherapeutic point of view, which I pointed out, which was obvious to me, but was not obvious to most analysts, that insofar psychotherapy works and produces persistent changes in someone's brain, it must be producing anatomical changes. And as we know from Helen Mayberg, people have done imaging outcome of psychotherapy. We can actually detect changes in brain function and structure as a result of psychotherapy. I think you'd probably uh, agree with this statement, that particularly important in the relationship between invertebrate and human memory, including memories that are established through psychotherapy, is the fact that the molecules involved in creating and sustaining the synaptic connections that underlie memory are conserved across species. Would you mind giving us a quick tour of what's involved? So uh, once we were able to define the cellular physiology, um, we were able to ask the question, what are the molecules that underlie these changes? Long-term memory involves gene expression, which involves a critical activator of gene expression called CREB, cyclic gain P response element binding protein. Um, that turned out to be critical in the placebo. If you remove it, you don't have any long-term memory. It turns out to have a similar role in learned fear in the mouse, as you showed. Um, and in spatial memory, explicit memory, in the hippocampus. Um, almost every memory process that's been looked at uses CREB as one of its components. There may often have additional components, but the core machinery is there. And that is gratifying to some degree, but not at all surprising. I think it's sometimes overlooked how fundamental the approach that you took was. You first asked a simple question, what is it that's learned? Then you asked, where does the learning take place? And then, where are the key cells and synapses to change? Finally, what molecules make these changes possible? In other words, what, where, and how? Today, everyone in neuroscience studying behavior follows this approach. I don't think it would be so commonplace if you hadn't made it so explicit and been so successful with it by using a simple behavior in a simple organism with a simple nervous system. You're very generous. I'm not sure the field would not have done. Uh, it, it, to me, it was sort of obvious. Um, and certainly, this is exactly the path you followed. But I followed you. I think you would have done it even without me. Um, we 
both came from a tradition in which behavior was greatly respected. Cognitive psychology on the one hand and psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis was a precursor of cognitive psychology. Um, and um, I think that's the key step. Many people were reluctant to study behavior because they thought as biologists they wouldn't know how to do it. And I was not frightened of that. Also, I was very fortunate. I recruited Irving Kupferman and Tom Carew, very gifted behaviorists, to work with me. They had not worked on snails before, but they realized you could shift over very easily. And so I learned a great deal from them. Um, and then I had been trained as a cellular biologist. Working out the neural circuitry was what I was doing, uh, looking at the connections. And then biochemistry came along, and molecular biology, also the field was evolving. So tools that made it easy to explore the molecular underpinnings came along. So I was also fortunate in the period in which I came along. The problems were opening up and the techniques were coming available. But you codified the approach. You're very nice to say that. I'm sure it would have occurred without me. <laughs> in recent years, through your work on mice, you've begun to ask questions that go beyond memory. You're looking at the mechanisms of attention and cognition, seeking answers to consciousness itself. What's your vision for the future of our field? How far can we go in our quest to map the mind and the brain? Biologists, as you and I both know because we share the sentiment, are delusional optimists. So I don't see any brick wall at the moment that prevents neuroscience from solving really all the challenges ahead of it. Eric, your most recent book is called The Age of Insight. In it, you wear two hats. Sometimes you're a scientist talking about conscious and unconscious aspects of the brain, and at other times you're an art historian talking about art being made during Freud's time in Vienna. The book has given me an enormous amount of satisfaction working on it. Uh, so I tried to make the point that different aspects of unconscious mental processes were discovered independently by Freud and Schnitzler, two physicians, and by Klimt, Kokoschka, and Schiele, three modernist artists. And as I pointed out before, Freud had tremendous insights into unconscious mental processes, didn't know much about female sexuality. Uh, Klimt, who was very experienced with the ladies, um, had enormous insight into female sexuality. And he has absolutely magnificent drawings of women having a completely free and independent erotic existence. I have a wonderful image in which I show one of Klimt's drawing of a woman uh, masturbating In, tr in tradition, it was treated mythologically, and it was sort of disguised. They didn't quite know whether the woman was covering a pubic set of modesty or whether she was masturbating. With Klimt, there's absolutely no question about what's going on. He also knew, for example, that women could fuse the eroticism um, with aggression. A fantastic painting of Judith and Holofernes. Come in. I wouldn't kill anyone, Marlow. No. Just a nice, clean campfire girl. She enchanted him. She got him drunk. She seduced him. And when he was drunk, seduced, and asleep, she cut off his head. And Klimt pictures her in an erotic moment, post-orgiastic, holding Holofernes' head stroking it if it's almost a sensual act with Klimt, Judas, and Holofernes, he realizes that women are capable of enormous aggression. And they confuse this with eroticism. Extraordinary painting. Well, we've covered memory, fear, sex, violence, and everything in between. No stone unturned on my mind's eye. Eric, thanks so much for taking time to share your thoughts with us. Your work was an inspiration for me when I started trying to map the brain mechanisms of emotional memory in rats, and I continue to admire your research and writings. Your recent books, In Search of Memory and The Age of Insight, are paradigms of science writing. It's an honor to be your colleague and friend. 
As is usually the case, we're going to close this session off with an amygdaloid song. Let's turn to Noah Hutton's music video of the amygdaloid's Map of Your Mind. <laughs> Made a map of your mind I've charted my course I'm sailing deep inside I got the winds of force Got the heat of your heart To keep me from the cold Got the currents of will to take me to your soul I'm on a journey That I've got to take It's a trip That I knew I'd make An excursion It's a voyage Fueled by fire Currents of will to take me to your soul.